Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von B. And today we're going to be talking a little Bee Gees. So as is often the case when I want to check out a new album, I got out a copy from the library. And as often the case, at least with the Toronto Public Library, someone lost or damaged the insert. So we just got this black and white version. But the original album art, uh, as maybe you can see from here with these weird lines and shapes, pretty psychedelic pretty weird. Uh, it actually, uh, the, the way the colorful flowers are designed on the riddle, it almost looked like someone pasted them on in construction paper. They don't quite match the photo, but that sort of possible flaw in design, I think it actually comes out looking kind of cool. The other thing you'll notice about this record is the Bee Gees, if you know the basics of them, understood as three brothers, Barry, uh, Maurice, or Morris, and Robin Gibb. However, back when they were first starting as a major band, I mean, they started as just the three brothers in Australia, but they went back to England to really make it a stars. And they decided, okay, to make this a full band, we need a lead guitarist. So they hired a guy named Vincent Malorny and a drummer named Colin Peterson. Uh, and the two of them are around for the first five or six albums before you know the Bee Gees in their famous period became just the three brothers again. The Bee Gees, along with the Beach Boys, who I've also talked about recently, I feel are one of these bands where the popular understanding of what they were misses half the story. So a couple of years ago, I hadn't really heard any Bee Gees. I kind of just assumed they were a one hit wonder with <laughs> staying alive. Uh, but a, a friend, uh, Silk Prince, who I interviewed on this channel before, uh, pointed out to me, no, they were a huge group in their time. So I went to the library at the time and I got out a greatest hit CD. And I was confused listening to this CD because I'm like, wait a minute, are there two bands called the Bee Gees? This doesn't sound like disco and staying alive at all. This sounds like the Beatles. And the fascinating thing with the Bee Gees is they had been around for over a decade when Barry Gibb discovered he had a really strong falsetto voice and that gave birth to the Bee Gees sound we knew and loved. But before that, they were quite a celebrated and well-recorded band sounding more like other British invasion groups. They were British by birth, uh, but they grew up in Australia where they started their career. Uh, they put out two albums in Australia. The one sort of famous song from one of them was Spix and Specs. But this record, technically their third album is called Bee Gees First. So this was the first one put out for the British and the American market. And now I'm gonna quickly go through the songs on it before talking about my overall impressions. So this album opens with dramatic orchestration uh, looking for a genre label, you think Baroque pop. It's a song called Turn of the Century, and the lyrics seem to be quite literally about wishing uh, the singer lived in 1900. Track number two is called Holiday. The lyrics here are kind of cryptic, but the tone of the singing, and I don't know, maybe Robin Gibb in particular and all the Gibb brothers just always had a melancholy sound at this point, but I think from context, it's pretty clear Oh, You're a Holiday is a kind of sarcastic remark. It's a sort of song about being in a constant defeated state, nothing makes you happy. The singer is clearly in a state of depression. Track three is called Red Chair Fade Away. This one also has a lot of orchestration, but the weird lyrics, I guess, give it a bit more of a psychedelic feel. Uh, the lyrics go, grandpa's fairy tale, red chair around the fire, rainbows all the time, we're all going higher. So clearly psychedelic imagery in there with being around the fire. But what stands out to me more is this idea of grandpa selling fairy tales. So if it's not clear from this and uh, from turn of the century, this is a record with a real focus on a vague kind of nostalgia for the past, perhaps just uh, 100 or then I guess 67 years in the past, or perhaps even further. The next song on the album is called One Minute Woman. It's a pleading song for a woman who I guess lacks the attention to commit. Uh, the one thing that stood out to me in this song is you could hear the potential Barry would show for that falsetto voice that later came out of the disco stuff. Uh, track number five is called In My Own Time. This one you get more of an early who sound rather than the Baroque pop. Uh, but the lyrics still have that nostalgic feel, you know, even if they're sounding like modern British rock, there, there's absolutely a nostalgia there because the lyrics keep talking about my own time. And what does this mean? These are really young singers. I believe Barry and Robin were 20 and 17 years old when they were writing the song, yet they're already talking about their my own time. So clearly either the Gibb brothers or one of the Gibb brothers had some sort of weird nostalgia, some obsession with the medieval past, or they were writing as a character. Uh, and I'm going to speculate based on several character 
songs later that if we want to interpret this album as a concept album, this character is Craze Fenton Kirk, who's a professor at the Royal Academy of Arts. Uh, track number five. Okay, okay, then you get to track number six. This is the weirdest track on the record. And look, this is already a, a weird record to listen to because it's nominally a rock group that would go on to be a disco group, yet the songs are absolutely drowned in classical orchestration. But this one, you can tell just from the title, every Christian lion-hearted man will show you is gonna take the cake for weirdness. So it opens with Gregorian monk chant, then the actual song starts and it sounds just like track five, like more of a 60s song, except they're just repeating, every Christian lion-hearted man will show you. I don't really remember the melody, but the point is it's a weird minimalist mix of being a band of the 60s and paying homage to this you know, relatively ancient singing style. So track seven introduces Craze Finton Kirk. It's called Craze Finton Kirk, Royal Academy of Arts. Uh, it's an attempt to shake up the sound again. The, the main instrument you're hearing is a kind of thick piano and it just gives a vibe of sort of skipping down the street and it fits the broader theme of wanting to be somewhere else, possibly in the past than where when you actually are. Track number eight, New York Mining Disaster. I think this was the first international hit for the Bee Gees. And you can hear how it's more of a hit than the other songs, but you can also hear how it's barely a hit. It has a sort of memorable repeating structure in the event of something happening to me. And it also works, I guess, that it functions as kind of a protest song about the difficult conditions that miners are working in. But it's also just kind of a weird song in that there's not a chorus to supplement that verse. It's just sort of a those three verses and it stays in a melancholy place. So it's right on the cusp of sounding like a hit, which is quite unusual on this record. Uh, but it doesn't do enough to, you know, put it in the top tier, I think, of BG songs. Track number nine is Cucumber Castle. So I was looking through the Bee Gees discography and it's confusing. So a few albums later, they make an album called Cucumber Castle and it has Barry and Morris on the front dressed up as knights, but the actual song Cucumber Castle is on this album, Bee Gees First. It's another song with a lot of orchestration. We're back to that Baroque sound and it's hard to really tell what it's really about. All I think is that it's quite literally about trying to imagine magical things in the very mundane world. So the opening line goes, there were the trees, see the grass, a thing gets inspired. So all I can imagine is a person is literally looking at like cucumbers stacked in a grocery store and imagining it's a castle and they can go inside. Track 10 is To Love Somebody. This one opens with a catchy rip string riff and it has more of a Motown feel to it. Uh, there's some rich orchestration and uh, singing is very expressive. So that makes it sound less overproduced, makes the orchestration sound less out of place than on some of the other songs. Track number 11, I Close My Eyes. Similar themes to what we've heard so far. The, the Motown sound kind of continues. What's maybe different about this song in the grand context of the album is that the singer is acknowledging that he's always imagining things, but maybe saying, uh, maybe this imagining is dangerous. Look at me, I'm riding high. Don't know what's wrong with me. Can't you see I'm not the guy that I pretend to be? Track 12 is called I Can't See Nobody. It is a thick sounding lead vocal from Robin. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's very soupy. It's a bit weird, uh, but it's it's rich. It's, it's beautiful if, if you're in the mood for this unique sound. And again, I can't tell if it's a sort of sarcastic, melan melancholy love, but falling out of love song, or that's just the timbre of Robin's voice. Track number 13 is Please Read Me. So remember this album looks really psychedelic, but it's more Baroque pop than psychedelic, except for this one track. Uh, the way the guitars and the vocals are recorded for this, this unequivocally sounds like something that could be on the Beatles, Revolver, or other psychedelic records. Uh, and it seems to be a plea to be understood when you're in the throes of delusions. Uh, because again, we've been hearing this whole record about this person constantly imagining, constantly wishing they were in the past, but at, at, perhaps in the medieval ages in Cucumber Castle. And then track 14 is Close Another Door. It sounds like it's gonna be the tragic ending to the album because it starts with some acapella singing, but then the guitarist comes in and it takes up a really jaunty pace. And the way I interpret this song is it's continuing on that message from Please Read Me. Uh, the chorus goes, close another door, listen to my eyes. So in other words, a normal person can be understood by being listened to, literally. You listen to the sounds that come out of them, their mouth. The singer is saying, look, I'm a little different. Listening to me is going to require a bit more attention. You're going to have to 
do something subtler, not listen to my words, but also listen to my eyes. But I'm going to hold out hope that that can happen. I can turn another leaf, close another door. And then finally, the song ends with some really beautiful orchestration. So when thinking about this record, a word I kept using is overproduced. Now, this is a word I've heard a lot over the years because I listen to a lot of singer songwriters who use big sounds and often employ orchestras to sort of emphasize the emotion in their work. Neil Diamond, John Denver, sometimes Cat Stevens. Uh, usually I don't agree with these assessments. So I know Paul McCartney thought that Phil Spector overproduced uh, his Beatles song, The Long and Winding Road, whereas I've always thought The Long and Winding Road sounded beautiful as is. And I imagine it's just for McCartney. It wasn't the song that was what's in his head. The thing is, orchestration can work wonderfully if it's creating a character in the room. You know, the singer is having thoughts and suddenly the thoughts become larger than their heads and that becomes embodied in the orchestra. So one of the great classic pop examples of orchestration is Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline, where you slowly hear the strings getting bigger and that chorus is accented by the horns. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, and the point there is Neil is singing about what a magical, undescribable feeling falling in love is. So it starts just with his nervous voice and then it builds up. Those instruments represent when the feeling is finally coming out of his body. Whereas on so many of these songs, uh, especially the opening turn of the century and uh, a lot of the others, it feels like they just came up with an orchestral arrangement that's entirely independent of what the actual song is underlying and it just sort of dominates and uh, the Bee Gees often have softer voices. Uh, they're, they're trying to, their voices are trying to flow out rather than come out with the punch of a Neil Diamond or a Cat Stevens. So in lots of cases here, the orchestration doesn't work. I talked in my recent video about the Beach Boys Smiley Smile and uh, Brian Wilson's Smile albums about how one of the things that was going on in the late 60s as the Beatles had hit the standard that had set the standard that rock music could be experimental, creative, high art, uh, and the way Brian Wilson tried to chase that and created a not great result in the process was trying to write songs that were so weird they didn't sound like songs anymore. The Bee Gees are imitating the Beatles here, I think, in a subtler way. Their songs still have melodies, but they're trying to add beyond the rock instruments. They're trying to rely on this heavy orchestration. And at the end of the day, it's just too much. So, you know, is this going to be your favorite album? Should this be an album to introduce someone to the Bee Gees? Absolutely not. But if you're in the mood to listening to some curious music, discovering the quirks of these guys who you just heard as dance singers before, that realizing they have wonderful imaginations that take them to places like Cucumber Castle, then this is a pretty cool record to find. But let me know, do you have a, a favorite Bee Gees record, especially if it comes from that pre-falsetto period when they sounded more like a Brit British invasion group? Let us know here in the comments below. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time.